Good morning and thank you for listening to The Bank on It Show with your host, John Saracusa, which airs every Tuesday and Thursday mornings on your way to work. And if you like what you hear, please feel free to give the show a five-star rating and a podcast application of your choice. You can also follow me on Twitter and Medium at John Saracusa, J-O-H-N-S-I-R-A-C-U-S-A, or on LinkedIn at Saracusa. In today's episode, I'm releasing my interview with Igor Talatnikov, co-founder and CEO of AlphaPoint. AlphaPoint is a white-label software company powering crypto exchanges worldwide. One of the interesting things about AlphaPoint is the quantity and quality of customers that they have. One example is the Royal Mint. I mean, the Royal Mint as in Her Majesty the Queen of England's Mint. The Royal Mint is the world's leading export mint, making coins and medals for an average of 60 countries every year. However, its first responsibility is to make and distribute United Kingdom coins, as well as to supply blanks and official medals. That's just one of many customers. AlphaPoint has raised over $17 million to date from firms such as Galaxy Digital, a VC firm created by Michael Novogratz. In 2008, Michael was ranked number 962 on the Forbes 2008 list of world's billionaires. So in the studio today with Igor Talatnikov. Igor is a co-founder and CEO of AlphaPoint. Igor, thanks for being here today. Thanks for having me, John. It's my pleasure. So why don't we get started with what exactly is AlphaPoint? Sure. So so AlphaPoint was created to help create the infrastructure for trading of digital assets. Okay. Uh, So we've been in the space for over six years, and we power customers in over 25 different countries, essentially helping them launch marketplaces for the trading of digital assets, cryptocurrencies, security tokens, and we also have products that help customers to tokenize assets. So take a piece of real estate, break it up into tokens that can then be traded on a market. Mm-hmm. You said you've been doing it for how long now? So AlphaPoint's been in the space for over six years. So we're, we're a veteran in the, in the cryptocurrency and blockchain space. And so recently you received your A round, right? Uh, Galaxy is your investor? Yeah. So Galaxy Digital led our A last year awesome. uh, in June of last year, actually a closed on our fifth birthday to the day. Congratulations. Thank it's you. Good birthday present. Yes, it was excellent. So how did you get your seed funding to get started? Yeah, so the seed funding, essentially, you know, when, when I partnered up with the, with the co-founders at Alpha Point, it was actually myself, my brother, we're serial entrepreneurs. We've had a variety of startups in media, finance, and other spaces as well. So we had some capital and kind of some sweat equity that we brought to the table. And then we brought in investors that had had success with us in the past. Mm-hmm. So why did you decide to create Alpha Point? Yeah, so, so the, the technical co-founders, Joe Ventura and Jack Salen, their backgrounds was building high-frequency trading systems, distributed database applications for financial services and, and Wall Street, really. So you know, Joe and Jack, they built trading platforms that you know, connected to all the major venues. They built you know, high-frequency risk management systems for mm-hmm. Deutsche Bank that was processing a large percentage of, of FX transactions in the world. And really, they wanted to bring that expertise to, at the time, which was a totally nascent industry. You know, really, it was Bitcoin, Bitcoin 2.0, which mm-hmm. then became blockchain, distributed ledger technology, and everything you see today. They saw an issue with the exchanges that were in the space. You know, it was Mt. Gox, Magic the Gathering was kind of the main exchange. So there was just a, a different institutional grade that was there was a gap in the market. There was a problem that needed to be solved. So taking that expertise, we really kind of built a product that helped to provide more access to the space than was possible before. So what were you doing before AlphaPoint? Yeah, sure. So so before AlphaPoint, I was actually investing and advising in companies and kind of an early seed incubator, private equity fund, really my brother and I being the partners, which was us taking capital for previous successes and putting it into startups we very quickly realized that we weren't as much interested in the investment piece as much as the operational, you know, and kind of actually building products, delivering them to the market, solving real problems. Mm. So, you know, everything that we actually invested in, we were pretty hands on with. Mm -hmm. And prior to that, there were, you know, a variety of successful exits, the largest being Lyft DNA, which my brother founded and was the, the CEO of, which was acquired by OpenX, which is the largest competitor to Google in the ad tech space. Hmm. The way we tripped over blockchain and fell into the rabbit hole was really, really with a fund 
a fund that started investing in, it was kind of a fund to fund strategy, but it started investing in new asset classes and cryptocurrency was one of those. You know, the decision was, let's actually partner with firms as our customers to take care of the marketing, banking, regulatory, customer service burden of going to market, right? So we bring the technology, our customers bring compliance, banking, you know, regulatory, marketing, et cetera. So it was, you know, something that we decided fairly early on and started bringing on customers and, you know, really, really focused on an international market, you know, of people that wanted to come into the space, whether they were an existing financial institution, whether it was an entrepreneur that wanted to bring, you know, access to Bitcoin, Ethereum, you know, digital currencies of any kind at the time to their native regions, right? And and a lot of our customers were the first in their region to provide, you know, a real to Bitcoin mm. trading pair, right? Having the local currency with a cryptocurrency pair. And they had the local presence, you know, the understanding mm. of the local laws. We had the technology that would enable them to, you know, to really stand up and run this business. So you went for a white label approach? We went through a white label approach. You know, essentially we've built a platform that our customer base you know, they will add their logo, their content, they'll decide how to operate the system, you know, how to manage deposits, withdrawals, verification levels, you know, your customer, anti-money, you know, all of these tools we've built as kind of configurable, you know, plugins. And we, you know, we're, we're excited to be that, that engine inside, right? Our, our slogan is the engine of exchange, right? We're the engine that the Intel chip inside that mm-hmm. powers these exchanges and marketplaces around the world. And our customers focus on, you know, competitive advantages in their region, you know, building new modules, customizing the front end, things like that, that, that differentiate them. And they can know they can rely on a, on a stable engine inside. So how many customers are using the platform today? Yeah, so so today we have over forty exchanges, wow. you know, brokerages and marketplaces on wow. the platform, uh, and that ranges that's from, worldwide. That's worldwide. Yeah, we we're actually wow. very heavily dispersed around the world. We have, you know, we have some customers in the U.S. We have customers in Canada, Brazil, Philippines, mm. you know, South Korea. It's really an international, you know, global footprint that we support. And we have over a million users, you know, on the system wow. uh, across those customers as well. Very early on, one of the competitive advantages we had is we had this remarketer tool that essentially shared liquidity between order books and was like an automated market making utility. Hmm. So that was key, you know, to, to launch a market, you always have the chicken and the egg problem. You won't have buyers if you have no sellers and vice versa. So we solved that problem by, you know, enabling our customers to launch with inventory on the shelf, if you will. So what are some of the things that you've seen throughout the years of, of building these exchanges locally in different markets? Well, we, we've seen a tremendous amount of regulatory clarity come in the space, which okay. you know, we're thankful for. You is know, this is, globally? And this is globally. And there's still a bit of differences of what that looks like based on region, right? There's still, you know, Japan that treats, you know, cryptocurrency like Bitcoin as a currency, the U.S. that treats it as a commodity, you know, certain cryptocurrencies or security mm. tokens might be securities. So there's there's a wide range of of laws and regulatory regimes that that touch this globally, which is why we, you know, we have to rely on our customers, you know, to actually fill that locally. But what we've seen over the years is there's been a lot more clarity, right? Early on, there was speculation on what the asset class was and how it would be treated. But we've seen a lot more clarity on that over the years. Mm. And so... Can I ask you, like, originally, how did the co-founders come together? Yeah, so it's, it's an interesting story. So it, it was actually Joe and Jack, the technical founders that I mentioned, that first built the technology, right? They built the technology and they, they launched a product in 2013. And I actually met, I met them at a conference about six, six months later or so. Right. And that at that conference, you know, as I mentioned, I was at this, you know, investment firm Svetlo looking for investments, looking to get involved in exciting projects, knowing that, you know, blockchain, cryptocurrency, this was the space it was going to be in. And there was actually an idea that I had to start a company to be kind of like a Schwab, you know, of cryptocurrency at the time, you know, make it easier to really, you know, purchase and, you know, deposit, withdraw, trade this asset class. And we actually were evaluating, we met 
Joe and Jack at a conference and we evaluated the platform, right? And at that time, they were looking for investment. They were looking for leadership. And that's when my brother and I came on as, as co-founders and really turned Alpha Point into what it is today. How long did you have four co-founders before you added your first employee? Yeah, so it was fairly fairly quick after that because we we raised capital and we had a plan of how to deploy that capital, right? Mm-hmm. So we actually, it was probably nine to 10 months into the founding of Alpha Point, but we we ended up hiring somebody, you know, a month after we brought capital in and, mm. you know, joining the company. And how long did it take to get your first customer? So the first customer was actually before I was even in, oh. in the company. There was kind of, yeah, I think there was a, maybe two or three customers on board. So, you know, we actually had customers kind of using an early version of the software. And, you know, I'd I'd say from the inception of the company, from when it was kind of started, it was about, it was from June to December. So it was about five to six months to get the first customer. Hmm. And after I joined, you know, we started bringing customers at a a pretty steady clip, you Hmm. know, a couple of customers a month. That's great. And so when do you think you got the product right? Yeah, so I think I think we had really good product market fit early. I think that the interesting thing in, in any company or startup is, you know, the market happens, right? Mm-hmm. And and there were definitely periods of, you know, crypto winter at the time when we started to explore, you know, other ways to leverage our technology or how to build technology to service a different part of the market. And, you know, for the first crypto winter, which was, you know, in 2015, I believe we went two, three quarters without a sale, right? And, wow. and which is, you have to properly have a drumbeat on cash and the operation of the company to make sure you survive, you know, an event like that. And, and I think that's, that's where the previous experience and, you know, not blowing through cash, you know, when you get it really kicked in and, and helped us survive and continue to grow, we had a book of business also that that helps, but in in those types of situations, you you experience sometimes higher churn rate, et cetera. But what we did during that period is we actually put a team to develop on top of blockchain and build this utility of being able to tokenize. So it's essentially an add on to what our first product was, which was this you know white label, private label marketplace. You know, launch ever, anywhere in the world. Now you could not only support existing assets. You could add on assets by, you know, taking your own assets and tokenizing them into a form that could then be traded on the market and then exchanged between different marketplaces. So, you know, that was exciting to, to release. We had some, you know, public POCs out there with, you know, banks like Scotiabank, et cetera. And then, you know, right at the tail when the market came back, we landed CME Group, you know, as as being a customer of our of our spot exchange software for a project they were doing with the Royal Mint, you know, which is, you know, Her Majesty's <laughs> Mint that, you know, creates coins and stores gold for, you know, over a hundred countries and, you know, a thousand year old organization. So, you know, it's exciting to see very large institutions start to enter the space and having built that brand reputation, credibility of going through all those challenges for several years previously with smaller financial institutions, you know, having a robust product that then a large enterprise, you know, has seen has been battle tested and feels comfortable going to market with. So how did you go from your seed to your A round? How long did it take to go from C to A? Yeah, so, yeah, so we raised the first seed round in 2014. And then we raised the Series A in June of 2018, mm-hmm. right? So it's essentially a four year, a four year period. And one of the reasons for that is that, that crypto winter that I mentioned in Mm -hmm. 2015, right? So we had, we had this kind of transitionary period and we, we ended up raising some bridge financing on convertible notes kind of in between there. And we, you know, we raised about a little under $3 million, you know, prior to the 15 cash injection from, from Galaxy. And, you know, overall to date, we've raised over $20 million. So how did you get the the A round? Like what metrics did you need to achieve in order to get there? Yeah. So we, we were, you know, as I mentioned, the benefactors of having built technology, having gone through, you know, the, the trials and tribulations mm-hmm. of the market and being ready for the market when the market came. Right. And so when the market came back in full force, right. And this was, this was kind of powered in part by the ICO craze, 
you know, but really when a much vaster part of the population could answer, you know, what is Ethereum, what is Bitcoin, mm-hmm. what is cryptocurrency, and then you had, you know, Bitcoin 2.0 and it's, you know, blockchain DLT form now getting, you know, feet, right? And having institutions really starting to pour millions of dollars into projects to tokenize assets, et cetera. So we had the benefit of being early, which is kind of one of the first tenets of hmm. understanding there's, you know, this very interesting technology that's going to solve problems, uh, having a solution for a very real problem, and then being able to pick up the market. So when the market came back, we started, you know, we really scaled the sales force. We were getting over 100 leads a week. Wow. You know, it was a lot of effort just to kind of weed through that. We had all the backlinks and kind of this history and the story and kind of the press we had done. So everybody essentially found us. We actually signed on resellers of the technology, mm. you know, so we we set up channel partners and different programs. And that really helped us accelerate our sales to a point that, you know, we became very, very interesting mm. to to an investor. So you said Galaxy led your A round, right? Correct. Did they take the whole round? They did. Okay. So what made them decide to do that, do you think? Yeah. So, you know, I think I think Galaxy and Mike Novogratz have been leaders in the space. You know, they've also been early believers and, you know, are investing in, in lots of different companies in the space at a variety of stages. I think where we were interesting for them is we were, you know, an in infrastructure technology, mm-hmm. you know, enabling the market, enabling you know, others to to build the infrastructure that was going to power the market as a whole, right? And I think, I think Mike and the Galaxy team also do think about you know growing the pie, you know, as much as getting a share of the pie, and that's that's really where we sit. You know, we're in the business of helping grow the pie of this market in general, right? By by enabling you know entrepreneurs and financial institutions of all sizes to launch, you know, these marketplaces, it really brings new consumers into the fold and grows that pie for everybody. So what type of opportunity do you see in the future for AlphaPoint? Yeah, so I think I think we we've seen traction with larger institutions coming into the space. Interesting. And, you know, we we have that battle tested technology, we're really focused on bringing you know, more enterprise clients into the fold, right? We have the largest broker dealer in Brazil is a customer of ours. And they, you know, they launched a marketplace in that region. So we see big opportunity of enterprise financial, you know, capital market, you know, juggernauts entering the space and us having unique technology that will help them do that faster or, you know, they they can rely on us for. We also see huge growth in the area of the tokenization of assets, and new marketplaces for that, right? And, and enabling, you know, traditionally illiquid assets that trade at a huge discount to find more liquidity and find, you know, better premiums for for their owners. So as you're building off a point, right, what are some lessons you learned along the way? What were some things maybe you would have done differently? I think one of the, the big lessons that we had was, you know, when the market is hot, you know, you always have this tendency of taking more on. Right. And and it's, the, it's this challenge because there there is a culture, not from our VCs, I would say, because we have excellent partners, but there's a general culture in the startup community of grow as fast as possible to any expense. And I think the biggest piece, you know, of advice I would give for an entrepreneur that that hasn't gone through this is when you're growing, you know, make sure that you have all the infrastructure in place to properly scale, right? And and scale is always something that's kind of discussed in entrepreneurial circles. But, you know, it's it's sometimes okay to, you know, instead of that 300% growth, go for 100 or 200. And, you know, you're actually, you, you might end up servicing your customers better, right? Mm-hmm. And, and that's what we always think about. How do we double down and focus on our customers better? And, you know, sometimes growing too fast or hiring too fast can put you at odds with that, right? Because if you don't have a good training program to bring on, you know, new employees, you know, you kind of, there's a certain type of entrepreneur and maybe when you're 20, 30, 40 people, you know, people can get the hang of it pretty quick. When you're a 50 to 100, you know, 120 person organization, it ends up being a much harder, you know, you need to have more institutional framework and scaffolding in place to onboard people, onboard Mm -hmm. customers, you know, and, and properly find efficiency in both. We actually, we implemented OKRs earlier this year. And and the, the reason we did is because we saw that 
you know, as I mentioned, when you're growing really fast, trying to do many, many different things without that focus, without trying to be the best at a narrow slice, you, you end up doing maybe more things, but not to that same efficiency and quality. So you, there was just the decision that, okay, there's, you know, there's a limited number of resources. Let's do the things that actually matter for mm-hmm. us and our customers. Let's think about what those things really are. Yeah. And it helps you, you know, as a product company, get away from just fulfilling customer requests, Mm -hmm. right? And just letting your roadmap be driven by customer feature requests. Because many times customers will ask for features, and this is any SaaS company or product company, it's it's death by by a thousand cuts if you try to accommodate every feature and every request. So this, this gives, you know, a framework of how to actually view very quickly, you know, even evaluating requests yeah. takes a tremendous amount of time. So having a framework of, does that actually align to our goals? Okay, yeah, yeah. one of our main goals is to drive user growth and adoption on the platform and, and activity on the platform. Does this new request fall into that or not? You know, and if it's not, then it's, it's a quick no, which many times customers appreciate. You know, a lot of companies, they you know, struggle to say no to their customers. You know, we try to say no quickly. And we try to say, well, what you're trying to accomplish, we think can be accomplished this way, mm. or here's the toolkit to accomplish gotcha. it without us. Hmm. Anyway, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks for having me, John. Now, that was a great interview. I want to personally thank Igor for being a guest on my show. But more importantly, I want to thank you, the audience, because if it wasn't for you, we wouldn't exist. And although this show is over, I look forward to seeing you next Tuesday morning on your way to work or releasing my interview with Sam Bobley from Aquilus. See you real soon. It's over, Johnny. It's over!